<laughs> Professor, congratulations for the award you just received. Uh, an award which is named after Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza. And this award uh, celebrates population genetics, which uh, is maybe the most powerful theory uh, at the basis of evolutionary biology we have today. It is a mathematical theory. So first of all, I want to ask you, what is exactly, in a few words, population genetics? Okay, population genetics is the study of genes in populations, that is in groups of people or groups of animals, asking what forces cause some genes to increase in frequency, other genes to decrease in frequency. And ultimately, all of evolution is the result of changes in allele frequencies and gene frequencies in, in populations. And how have you seen uh, this field change in, in time in the last decades since, uh, you know, Cavalli Sforza's time? Well, when Cavalli Sforza started working in human population genetics in the 1950s, the only genes that he could study were genes that you could distinguish by blood types, the ABO blood group and other blood groups. In the past 60 or 70 years, there has been a tremendous explosion in the amount of information on genes. Now we have millions of people whose complete DNA sequences are available. We have DNA sequences from fossils as old as 100,000 years ago. Um, there's more data than we know what to do with. And typically it is thought that evolution is just a matter of natural selection. But there are much more important processes at work in uh, population genetic dynamics. What they are and how do they work? A very important process in population genetics is called genetic drift, which is the change in gene frequency because of accident, because sometimes they tend to go up a little bit or they tend to go down a little bit. Um, in each generation, that causes only a minor change, but over very long periods, that causes profound changes in gene frequencies. And what can we do with population genetics? What is it good for? What kind of applications do we have with population genetics? Well, one, one thing population genetics is very good for is reconstructing the past. The study of modern human populations and their extinct relatives has given us a very clear picture of the history of human populations going back hundreds of thousands of years. And the same is true for non-human populations. We've learned a lot about the history of populations, which uh, affects their conservation, what we can do about their conservation, what we learn about the past of life on Earth. And one of these fields uh, is part of your uh, latest research. For example, you collaborated with the Leipzig group in Germany to study Neanderthals' genomes and uh, ancient human origins. Yes, yes, I've helped analyze the Neanderthal genome data and the Denisovan genome data, and, try, and we tried to establish the relationship between these extinct groups and modern human populations. And that's, that's the kind of mathematical theory that, that I have worked on. Speaking of mathematics, some say that um, a discipline is, has a scientific, has uh, the amount of mathematics it contains. Is it evolutionary biology healthy from this point of view? Well, evolutionary biology is very healthy because it combines information about natural populations that specialists in field research um, bring us from the field. That is, we and then the mathematical theory to help understand the observations that natural historians uh, provide. And in human populations, the, the, the subjects of anthropology and archeology span play the same role. We need to, mathematical theory can explain a lot, but it has to know what, what needs explaining. And how do you see the future of the discipline? I think the, the theory, the statistical analysis of genetic and genomic data will develop tremendously. It's an area with almost unlimited opportunity because there are so many things we don't know about the history of humans and about the genetic basis of human genetic diseases. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you.